Okay, welcome. Today is uh, lecture 13. We're in week seven. So this is the second half of the module. Um, starts to get a bit serious now. Um, I've been thinking about exams. You should probably be thinking about exams and um, what's required. So um, this is one of the key theoretical topics that I'll be discussing in the exam. So it would be important that you look at this lecture and tomorrow's lecture and review them. There will be they will be appearing in the exam. Okay, I tell you this. I mean, they're, they're no, I mean, I'll tell you everything that's appearing in the exam. Okay, there's no surprises for me at all. But this is probably apart from the coding stuff. This is the first part that's really important um, in terms of theory. And this is about um, your first introduction to software design patterns. And we're going to be looking at object-oriented design. And in particular, we're going to look at solid. Okay, and that's an acronym that we're used to describe the first five object-oriented principles. And what's important now to realize, and, and I mentioned this last week and probably a few times intermittently throughout the module, is that you all know how to write code. I need you to be able to write good code that follows on from the design. Okay, so how do you design good code? How are you able to look at your code and decide, actually, that's a really good piece of code, you know, that or if this is a bad piece of code, or how can I make my code better? Sometimes you might hear about refactoring, um, where you take a, a piece of code that you've written and you rework it and redesign it and, and rebuild it. Okay. And so that's something that you're gonna to have to learn how to do, and it's something I want you to know how to do, and, and it comes with a little bit of practice, okay, and a little bit of expertise. Now, many of you are really good coders. You're really good designers. You've learned a lot of these things because you've been given examples that are good examples. But what happens is that sometimes the code that you work with is small, and so you just end up modifying these small examples. Okay? And really, what's, what happens is that when you start writing bigger programs, and you start modifying programs, I like the kind of stuff that you've got in assignments, where I give you an assignment, and then I ask you to work on the next assignment and it looks like you're going to extend the previous assignment or you can build on those assignments then you're building on code and, and the reason I, I i give you those kind of assignments is because i want you to understand and realize the complexities around being able to extend code or modify code so that you think about this not to start with something new and that reusing your code or extending it in some way can cause problems a little bit later in terms of designs now, not too many problems for you because you're still dealing in the order of hundreds and perhaps thousands of code, uh, thousand lines of code. But if you start working into the hundreds of thousands of lines and millions of lines then they're, for applications, then it becomes can, can become problematic. We need to understand how everything works and how our code can be better. So really, that's, that's why it's important um, that we learn about these principles. We're going to look at this um, at solid. Okay? And just to show you that I don't lie when it comes to exams or anything, you know. Um, I I wanted to show you the question bank. A question bank. This will change slightly, okay? Oh, I hate these screens. <laughs> we wait for it to come back, okay? So, as I mentioned to you previously, that this particular exam is in two parts. The first part is a multiple choice question uh, quiz or you answer two questions. You've got 30 minutes for each question. And the question that you get will be randomly chosen from a bank of 10 questions for that particular question. So there are 20 questions in total, okay? Mostly theoretical, all having to do some kind of um, little, little bit of, uh, um, maybe some code examples as well, okay? And that's worth 20% of the, the module. Your continual assessment is worth 50% of the module and there are five assignments and you get 10 for each one. There's a coding exam, which really is an extension or a modification of the final assignment that you do. So you should be able to do the coding exam by looking at your design and your solutions for the previous one and then transferring that across in a way. You know, a lot of stuff you'll learn from the, the last couple of assignments. And they will be about re implementing undo and redo using memento or command design patterns. Okay, so you need to know how to do those and then you'll be able to make them work. And that will bring into the coding exam and that's worth 30%, okay? But this is the question bank, or it's a question bank. And um, so you can see I 
clearly ask you some some aspects of this where I say, well, we haven't done this Pete, yet on design patterns. We'll come in the next few classes. But let's move down to, to the set question two. And here's question two. And, um, and for example, I just ask, describe the importance of solid design principles. Describe using a C-sharp example of your own design, how to apply solid SRP in practice. And describe using C code example your own design, of your own design, three different methods to write the C-sharp link query. So a little bit of C, a little bit of coding in there as well, but most of the, the marks will go for the, the theory bit. Okay. And what's important in this here is that and a code example of your own design. The reason I'm telling you this now is because it has to be something that you've actually worked on. If you, I'm not, I don't want you to give back the stuff that I give you in the notes or something, okay? You're gonna have to start now trying to look at the example and modifying it and give me a version that will work for you to show that you actually understand it. It can be very similar, but it needs to, it needs to be of your design. Okay, so people often say, well, I answered that question, I did great. Yes, no, you didn't. <laughs> the reason you got one mark is because you showed me your theory, but you didn't actually give me an example that was of your own design. You just copied and pasted it from a resource, and I was able to just copy and paste it from your answer, put it into Google, and find exactly where you found the answer. Right? So you don't get marks for being a good Googler, you get marks for actually designing the software. Okay? So we can talk about examples a little bit later, but I just wanted to show you that. When I say I'm doing something in class, it's going to be important for the exam. It's important for the exam. You know, I don't lie. Okay. And I, you will randomly get one of the principles. To, one of the five principles will come up in one of these questions. Okay. Okay. So it's, this is doable. I will publish this bank in a couple of weeks time once I've reviewed and made sure it's okay. And you will have from week eight or week nine until the, until January or February to be able to look at the questions and try to plan an answer. Okay. Plan your answers. You don't know which question you're going to get, right? But you could plan all of them, yeah, and 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 do some work in terms of this is how you prepare for an exam. Okay, no surprises from me. It will be this is what's going to happen. This is what you need to do, and you do what you get the marks. It's easy, you know, and that's fairly straightforward for me. I can tell you that out of hundreds of students, maybe only two or three people will get 100% in my module, okay? So publishing the exam and having the question, people go away going, I have the questions, it's great, you know? That's no use, okay? Ultimately, you need to have your answers. There's an awful confidence around having questions and knowing what's coming up in the exam, but sometimes that doesn't make any difference in terms of how you study for the exam. You still have to do the work. You know this from CS230, right? You know? You know, I had 260 or 280 people doing it last year. I published all the questions. How many people got 100%? Maybe about five. Yeah. So please, you've seen this model before. Some of you, some of you haven't seen it, of course, before, but this is how it works, okay? And we can just look at the exam. You'll see this is the exam, you know? So you get a question that looks like this. Here's something, question one. Here's question two. I can start a new preview. And uh, I can start my attempt and the exam. And I get a, another question. Okay. So it's no surprise, easy to do. Take the lecture notes, work through them, work in your own examples, have those ready. You did one a week. <laughs> until the rest of the exam, you'd be you'd be done. And one a week only takes a couple of hours work. You'd be prepped for the exam. No reason why you shouldn't get there, okay? It's about like management. It's about time management and planning. I'm going to make time in my day to do some work for CS264. Yeah, and you'll get there. There's no reason why you shouldn't all do well. Okay. Any questions before I move on to the lecture proper then? I'm always happy to take questions, you know. No? Okay, we'll come back to the exams again at some point. Okay, so SOLID refers to these five important design principles when conducting object-oriented design. And my examples will be in C-sharp. They will apply to any object-oriented language, you know, Java, that you know and know well at this stage, object-oriented JavaScript, for example, as well, or any of these languages that you know, they'll be fine, okay? They were introduced by 
Robert C. Martin, who you'll see sometimes in the literature refer to Uncle Bob as Uncle Bob, okay? And, and in his paper, which was entitled Design Principles and Design Patterns. So that was 2000. So it's a, you know, a long time ago, okay? You're probably very young at this stage, you know? Um, but it's been around a long time and it's withstood the test of time, okay? Um, and the SOLID acronym then was later introduced by Michael Feathers, okay? And, and so SOLID stands for the Single Responsibility Principle, SRP, Open Close Principle, OSP, Liskov substitution principle after Barbara Liskov from, and this was a principle that applied in the 1970s, okay? So I was only a child myself in the 1970s, okay? So it's been around a long time. Interface segregation principle and dependency inversion principle. And we'll look at each of these in the class today. And in the lessons that follow in lecture 14, the five short lessons, I'll give a code example for each of them when we work through them. So I'll give you the original code and I'll show you some better code. So you have a chance of understanding how to improve on those. Okay. So when they're combined together and make it straightforward for, for a developer or designer to make software that's easy to maintain and to extend, that's good design. So I, I know I actually it wasn't clear in the past, but I, I should have actually said at some point, and maybe I did, but it's very likely that I didn't, that what's good software? Good software is software that's easy to maintain and it's easy to extend. So this is something to bear in mind. And this is why, as I said, at the core of my assignments, I'm always asking you in the next assignment to extend the existing program in some way, extend it. And how do you extend it in a way that makes it better and that becomes extendable again? You know? So these are, the, these are the, the thoughts you need to have when you're doing your work, okay? And that will, be, it will, be, um, that will make sure that you have some good designs. So in practice, it provides us with some approaches to move away from tightly coupled code. Okay, tightly coupled code. A tightly coupled code is how do you, how do you know if, a, if you've got really cohesive code? You do this in software engineering as well. Okay, I know you do because I taught software engineering at one point. But you know, cohesive code is where you know if you look at your code and you're seeing lots and lots and lots of new, you're creating new objects and all the various code. It's apart from some very low level classes, you're probably far too too cohesive, far too highly coupled. So don't do that. Um, um, you want to have poor encapsulation, perhaps, you know, so where everything, we talked about this in terms of methods um, embedded in classes and so forth. You want to have a more desirable design where we have loosely coupled code, it's encapsulated and meets modern requirements. Okay, so we work through the five principles in this lecture. Any questions before we move on? Okay, so SRP. Right. Now, there's a lot of words here, okay? There's a lot of examples. These are, it's very dense. I mean, I could probably give a lecture on each of these principles, okay? But we haven't time to do this because we have a lot to learn. And so it's kind of a shallow thing here. And uh, I'd like you to maybe revise this or come back to this at some point yourself, okay? And have a read of these. And there are links in the bottom of the, the page where you can click and have a look through and you'll be able to um, click through and have a little bit of extra reading. So anyway, SRP tells us that a class should have one and only one reason to change, meaning a class that should have only one job. Class should not take on the role of doing many jobs. All right. Now you might say to yourself, oh, too many classes, you know, like, you know, in my thing. Well, how do you know you've got too many classes? You might have just enough classes for a good design, or you may have too few classes and so forth. But how do you know? Really? And this is the principle that tells us a little bit about that. The main point you have to look at, and you've got to ask, and you ask these questions of your code, uh, and you look at your code, or you ask them of yourself, you know, as a designer, because the code, you know, comes from you, all right? You say, um, do your classes, are, they, are your classes doing many things, and are they responsible for a single task? You know, they're, they're a bit of a checklist. It's easy to do. So it makes it software easy to implement and it prevents unexpected side effects, okay? And that's the problem. You get side effects when you make changes. The more responsibilities in your class has, the more often you'll need to change it. So if a class implements multiple responsibilities, they're no longer independent of each other, okay? So classes and other software components that have only one responsibility are much easier to explain, they're easy to understand and implement than the ones that provide the solution for everything, okay? When we looked at REST APIs and CS230s, it was a good design then and it's appropriate now. Adhering to good design principles reduces the number of bugs, improves your development speed and generally makes software development easier. We have huge amounts of issues with when we start to change software that works. A really interesting um, experience with the HSE of late, okay? So I 
had my original vaccine and a long time ago because I have an immunocompromised. Um, and so I got my original vaccine and then I got my second vaccine. And then because I'm immunocompromised, I ended up getting a third, a call for a third vaccine. So I went, got my third vaccine, did this kind of stuff. But the system in place that they had clearly wasn't set up originally in terms of this design for three vaccines. Okay. So something has got, everything worked nicely along the way originally. But I have, I, I call, was called, I went, and the data was updated, allegedly. And I have been contacted five times to go for my third booster since. <laughs> five times. And I called them every time and say, look, I got this. It says, yeah, we have the details in the system. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be getting it. All the processes are in place. Something has happened. Somebody has made a change somewhere, the software, and it doesn't work. And you saw the same kind of thing happening with the calculations of the CAO results a while back, yeah? When they were doing these all sorts of calculations and they made it, somebody made a change. <laughs> the results were wrong, okay? The points were wrong. You have to be really, really careful about making a change somewhere and the impact of that change will happen somewhere else. I may or may not behave as you ultimately expect. You know, you can very easily introduce problems by making changes. And usually this happens because you have a module that is doing more than one thing and you make the change on one part, well, actually, it might be called in a different way by another piece of software. Cause some error. So we have to ultimately be really careful about this stuff. So let's have a look at a, a simple example. So again, a class should only do one job, have only one reason to change. And, uh, and so let's say what happens. So if we've got an area calculator up here, okay, all this does is it calculates the area of an object's list of shapes. So what's happening here is it's iterating over a bunch of shape in a shapes list in some way, um, or an object array actually. It's a, okay, and um, so we end up calculating the area for something if it's a rectangle and if it's a circle. So what's happening here is that this particular area calculator, you could say and you could try to convince yourself, yes, it's doing one job. It's calculating the area. Well, actually, it's doing two jobs because it's calculating the area of a rectangle and it's calculating the area of a circle and it's then adding up the total area of all of these things, okay? There are no constructors in this square and, and circles, okay? So this is, so you might say, well, yeah, it does the job, okay? And yes, of course it does the job, okay? And it works, but this is the difference between having a piece of code that works and a piece of code that's designed well and works. So we have to look for instances as to why. So if we want to make a change, how do we, how do we um, deal with this? So in order to be, able to be able to use the area calculator class, we just instantiate the class and pass an array of shapes. We could display the output to the console in a fairly straightforward manner as well. So here, okay. So here we have a new circle, new circle. We have this list of rectangles and we calculate the area and we just write out something else here. So there are all sorts of issues around this because it's doing more than one job. And again, it comes to the fore and to our notice when we try to make some changes. So the problem here, for example, um, relates to the output method, okay? Because this output method here, this one here, actually calculates, calculates the um, area and it writes the output. So we, you, I see this in some of your code as well. So sometimes you want to be able to have a create, create an output of a, an SVG, for example, but we might also want to be able to create an image, which is a different kind of output. Okay. So where do you put the outputting happening? Is the outputting embedded in the methods in the class themselves, or do you have a separate outputter that does this work? Okay. So it's really interesting as far as that, what we want to actually have here is we have an area calculator and an output formatter. So we might want to output to JSON, we might want to output to HTML, we want, might, might, might want to output to, to SVGs. So, but the problem is that every time we want to actually change a different kind of output, we actually have to modify the class. So we have to change it because it's starting to do more than one job. So in other words, we have to keep adding uh, a lot more methods. So it becomes an area calculator and it becomes an output formatter. 
So the single responsibility principle tells us that it should only sum the areas of the shapes and it shouldn't care whether the output wants to develop JSON or HTML. We need to have a separate method to do all this kind of work. Okay. I have issues with this area calculation thing as well, where it's doing the calculations, okay? This is uh, an issue for me in terms of design here, but that's a different principle <laughs> to deal with, okay? Because it's doing this kind of calculations here as well. And every time we want to add another shape, for example, we'd have to add another change to this one here as well. We have to update this, okay? And by updating this, there's a chance we could mess up everything. A better design, and we'll see this in a later principle, would be to actually add the, the calculations for the areas within the actual objects themselves. Okay. So there's lots of things going on here. Um, we'll have to think a little bit about it. But the main point, I guess, is the class should have only one, and should have one and only one reason to change. Class should only have only one job. Any questions? Okay, so if the principle is that we have two reasons to modify a class, then we split the functionality into two classes. So each class will handle only one responsibility. And if in the future we need to make a change, we'll only make the change in the class that handles the update. And we could also use interfaces here to help with this. Interfaces are your go-to construct, really, for good design. Okay, abstract classes and interfaces, you know, if I'm not seeing them in your code, something wrong here a lot of the time okay or some variant of that okay when we need to make a change in a class having several responsibilities then there may be unwelcome side effects to the change so the change can affect the other functionality related to the other responsibilities of the class and we we have and that can happen so it's an excellent way of identifying classes during design phase of an application it should be provocative and it should remind you to consider all various ways that a class may or could evolve and a good separation of responsibilities will have been achieved only when the complete understanding of an application should work following the application of the single responsibility principles. Loads to take in here. That's okay. The takeaway is that classes should only do one thing, right? So the last four, 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 four slides, classes should only do one job, okay? And if they do only one job, then the change, you'll only be changing them you know, for when that job changes, okay? Right, we have another one called the open closed principle. And this was introduced by Bertard, sorry, Bernard Meyer, and it says that software entities, those are classes, modules, functions, should be open for extension, but closed for modification. These all sound like sound bites, you know, like they should be on a t-shirt or something, you know, like in a way, right? You know, but what does that actually mean for us, okay? So it means that we should attempt to write code that does not have to be changed every time the requirements change. Now that might seem strange, okay? That might seem strange. But the design should be done in a way to allow the addition of new functionalities as new classes, keeping as much of, as possible of the existing code unchanged. Resist the temptation to make a change to the class, the existing class when you have a new requirement. So if you look at the first couple of assignments I ask you to do, then you might say, oh, I'll just go in and make, I'll add another method to that class, or I'll get it to do something else, in addition to the job it's doing. And so you have to say to yourself, well, was that, now you say to yourself, well, is that a good idea? Because it's the job doing more than one thing. And then you also have to say to yourself, um, am I actually adding new functionality by changing the code? in that class? Or am I able to increase the functionality and fulfill the requirements in a way that I don't have to change the existing code? I can literally add in new code, but I don't have to keep changing it in some way. Okay? That's what's key, and that's what's crucial here. Okay? So, this might depend on the context, of course, depending on our programming language and how it's set up. But when we're using C Sharp or Java, or other statically typed languages, the solution often involves inheritance polymorphism. So that's why it's there. 
And the recommendation is that entities like classes, modules, and methods should be open for extension, closed for modification. Okay? So the classes, for example, should be easily extendable without modifying the class as well. So, so, so take a class, and you can extend it. And remember, we don't want to change the functionality in that class in a way, but we want to be able to add new functionality by, by producing some kind of subclass or something. Okay. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so let's say we have a rectangle class here. Okay, it has a height and a width and an area calculator that calculates the area of these rectangular objects. Okay, now let's say we want to actually calculate the area of other shapes, not just rectangles. Okay, so we could modify the area calculator class to do this by checking the type of the shape. Okay, here we could check the type of the shape and then cast to the type and calculate the area of that type of shape. That makes sense? We could do it that way, yeah? Everybody got that? We could do it here, yeah? If a shape, it, you, so you switch the shape, or you can just switch the, or, well, you do an if, because you can't switch on something that isn't enumerative, enumeration, but you, you can cast the type. And let's say, well, if this is a rectangle, then do it this way. If it's a, a circle, calculate it this way, and so forth, yeah? This is the example I gave you early on, so think back to that one, because I did tell you that that was rubbish, okay? Right. Was it a good design? Nah. Okay. So what happens if we want to extend the area calculator to calculate the area of triangles? So here we can say, here's an area calculator. It's taking a, a, an array of shapes. Um, shape, they're just objects, okay? So we're, so we're saying then for every shape that's in shape, if the shape is a rectangle, then do this, and if the shape is a circle, then do this. So how, what do we have to do? So if it's a triangle, we just say, if the shape is a circle, is a, is a rectangle, or the shape is a circle, or the shape is a triangle, we have to keep making the changes here, okay? So it's not complex, but it could go on indefinitely because it depends on the number of shapes or different kinds of shapes we want to do. So to keep making this change every time. So what it's telling us is that the area calculator class is not closed for modification because we need to make changes in order to extend it. In other words, it is not open for extension. Yeah? That's what's going on here. There's lots going on here. Okay, lots. So this is about, you know, you might think, but there's only a few lines of code here, John. You know, what's going on? You have to start thinking deeply about the design and the code. Now, many of you will do this kind of automatically because you've learned to code in a particular way, and it's a good way, you know? You've got good Java instruction, for example. But you haven't been thinking about why you're coding that particular way. We have to get into a mindset where we're thinking about it. Yeah. I mean, if you get to an interview and somebody says, what's the problem with this piece of code? <laughs> Imagine you went to an interview, a coding interview, and they say, here's a piece of code. How would you modify this so that it handles triangles as well? And you, instant reaction might be, oh, yeah, well, let's have a... Let's change this to be circle, else if shape is circle, and then else if it's triangle or something. Yeah. What happens if actually you say this is an object array, so this object array can contain an array of anything. So let's say it's past, you know, you know, a banana object. And we don't have the rules for this. Well, we don't even have something here that throws an error if it's something that isn't in the list. Yeah? Rubbish code. Okay? Rubbish. Loads of ways you can break this code. I love looking at somebody's program and then making it break, you know, including my own. You know, I, nothing, nothing gives me more pleasure than sitting down at somebody's program and it's waiting for an input and I type in something that it doesn't expect and watching it fail. Okay, first thing I do when I get a menu driven program from students is I type in something like banana and see what happens. Quite often, you'd be really surprised, you know, about 40% of the time the programs just crash because they're not getting the input it expects because you as a designer are writing around you in the way you know it works. That's great fun, okay? Bad code, okay? Easily fixed. Always try to break your code. Always, always try to break it because you get people like me who will try to break it. I used to love breaking into things when I was a young fella, you know. Software, I'd break into software, you know, anywhere I could, anywhere. 
I was a, I was a first year student. I broke into the university um, system, VMS system at the time. Got operator privileges. I could do anything I wanted with the university system, you know, and did for. Now I didn't do anything nefarious. I just wanted to look around. But I did for months before they caught me, right? You know, like, and then they gave me a job because they didn't know what to do with somebody like me. Okay, you know, like at that point, you know. I was worried. I, I never for a minute thought I might get kicked out of university, you know, because I was just having fun, you know. But have fun with code, guys. You know, it's um, look at it and turn it around, twist it, see how it goes. You know, you 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 always people write software that can be broken if it's a bad design. You can you can do fun things with it. You know, that's why people talk about backdoors. You know, so much is going on with WhatsApp and all these other things. You know, they are constantly making changes because people are constantly trying to find ways to break into it. Okay. Not that there's anything wrong with the software, but sometimes a change is made and then it has a, an implication uh, you know, for, for another part of the software. Yeah, And this is because it's a huge piece of software. It's complex. You have many teams of people working on it. And it's actually not closed for modification. OK? OK? It's not open for extension. So, so we ought to watch that kind of stuff. OK? And there are loads of examples you know, about that kind of stuff. OK? okay. So using abstract class shape as a parent class, ensuring that the subclasses implement the area method used by area calculator, then the area calculator is closed for modification by opening it up for extension. Simple, robust class now. It's easy. Yeah. And this is probably the way you would think about writing it. Well, I, I don't know. This is the way I would think about writing it. Okay. You may not think that this is the way you start looking at this. You might not start thinking about the fact that we have to think about abstract classes and the functionality and extending those. You may, you may not be thinking like this. You may be copying code, you may be looking and say, oh, that's how we do it, but you might not be thinking about it. This is how you start thinking about it, in a way. Okay, there's lots going on. Okay, we've only done two principles. Any questions? No? So using the open codes principle, the problems in the previous design are avoided. Area calculator is not changed when a new shape class is added. No unit testing is required because there's no need to understand the source code. There, that's beautiful. As the area calculation code is moved to the concrete shape classes, there's reduced risk that the old functionality will be impacted if new functionality is added at a later stage. Lots of design patterns that assist with extending code without changing it. So for example, the decorator pattern allows us to follow OCP and the factory pattern or the observer pattern, they can be all used to design an application that's easy to change with minimum changes to the existing code. And we're going to see about all of these design patterns in some later lectures. Okay. This is meant to be motivational. Okay. You know, maybe not, you know, but that's the plan, right? You know. Okay, so Liskov substitution principle. This one's a bit bit more tricky. Okay. I'm going to give you the original line that was introduced by Barbara Liskov in her keynote um, data abstraction, 87, sorry, I said 70. Okay, so um, herself and Jeanette Wing, they published this paper, which they defined the principle as let phi x be a property provable about, uh, about objects x of type t, and phi y should be true for objects y of type s, where s is a subtype of t. Okay. okay so there's a bit of maths going on there. Okay. We can look at it in a bit of an easier way, and it defines that objects defines that the objects of a superclass shall be replaceable with objects of its subclasses without breaking the application. Okay. So if you have a, a class and then base class or parent class, and then you have a child class that extends that parent class, then the parent class should be replaceable with objects of its subclasses without breaking the application, without the functionality happening. That means then it's it's in LSP, OK? It fulfills LSP. Somebody says it's in LSP, OK? It doesn't violate LSP, OK? OK? It means that the objects of the subclasses need to behave in the same way as the objects of the superclass. And, and it's achievable by following some basic rules. So we have to ensure that the derived classes or the subclasses only extend without replacing the functionality of the base or parent classes. That's a really key line here, okay? That's the bit. That's the bit that we, we need to know about. 
we must ensure that the new drive classes or subclasses only are child classes. They only extend without replacing the functionality of the base parent classes. Otherwise, the new classes can produce undesired effects when they're used in existing program modules. A lot of the time we have this boxing going on, you know, or casting and so forth happening. So we need to be careful. So we need to be able to replace the child, the parent with the child and still have the same kind of functionality that we would have expected of the parent. Make sense? Does that make sense? Yeah. So you don't, so it's like about the overriding method thing, you know, <laughs> like overriding, you should really be only overriding an, an, an abstract method. You don't change the behavior in a way. Yeah. That, does that does that make sense to you? You try to add additional behavior in the in the child class. That's where you put that information. You don't make it behave differently. So it's about extending it in a way. It's not like replacements. Any questions? This is a bit of a tricky one. I always find this one's a bit, you know, why would I do this? But of course, at the core of this is your understanding of polymorphism. So really, this is all about polymorphism in a way. Okay. So it tells us that an overridden method of a subclass needs to accept the same input parameter values as the method of its superclass. Okay. So you can implement less restrictive validation rules, but you're not allowed to enforce stricter rules in your subclass. So that means any code that calls the method on an object of the superclass might cause an exception if it gets called with an object of the superclass. So we don't want that to happen. But similarly, the return values of the method in the subclass need to comply with the same rules as the return value of the method of the superclass. So you can only decide to apply even stricter rules by returning a specific subclass of the defined return type or by returning a subset of the valid rules values of the superclass. OK, there's no easy way to enforce this, right? You you, as a developer, need to implement your own checks to ensure that your code follows the principle. So code reviews, test cases, they're very useful. Um, execute appropriate parts of your program with objects of all the subclasses to make sure none of them causes an error or significantly changes the performance. And remember, if you're worried and you want a soundbite or a takeaway, LSP is all about polymorphism. OK, good stuff. Any questions? Some people would say that being able to ask a question shows a level of understanding <laughs> by not asking questions <laughs> means that you don't understand. But look, if you don't understand, I get it, right? It's hard. This is this is hard stuff, okay? It's a bit of a, a jump up. It's a bit of a change of mindset because of the coding. A um, lot going on here at the same time. Um, but that's okay, right? You know, If you go away today with one takeaway, one of them, then that's okay. Then you have loads of time to think about the rest of them. It's all right, yeah? As I say, most of you are good coders anyway and good designers. It's just a question of like understanding why you're a good designer or why you're a good coder. Yeah? Yeah? So it's um it's not too bad, you know. Um we'll do examples of all of these in the next little lessons as well. Okay. So let's say we have a base class and a child class. So that means we have this inheritance relationship. So if we can successfully replace the object instance of a parent class with an object or an instance of the child class without affecting the behavior, then it's said to be in the LSP. Okay. Here's an example. If a parent is a professor and their child is a surgeon, in this case, the child cannot replace the parent, even though both belong to the same family. Does that make sense? So the, the, the surgeon couldn't go in and give the teacher. So if the teacher is a maths teacher, you know, and she's there giving her class, and then her daughter comes along who's a surgeon, and then you know she can't give the class in maths, you know, because that's not her job. Okay, so it's the same kind of thing happening there. Okay, and that, that's it in terms of the reality. Okay, it's not there's nothing strange there. Okay, your little star, by the way, is because um, it was very gender based initially, and probably. I wanted to change that a little bit for you. So um, anyway, but you can read the original source without being too offended by this. But anyway, the child class shouldn't break the parent class's type definition of behavior. And actually, LSP is very similar in principle to the open close principle. Very similar. Okay. There's a brilliant stack overflow example on um, uh, about this, these two. And I'll, I'll give you the link, OK? And we'll, we'll be able to have a look at this. OK. so. Um, so here we have 
apples and oranges, okay? Not great. Example, well, I've seen this, okay? And I'm using, I'm using the apple and orange here just so that you can see the difference starkly. So we have a program that has an apple class, parent class, an orange class, which is a subclass. Why would you do this? You wouldn't do this, and all you're doing is because you're mapping apples and oranges onto it in terms of your understanding. They're not apples and oranges, they're just names that are given to these classes, okay? Right? That's all that matters, okay? There's something at a higher order thinking going on that, like, you know, apples are not the same as oranges in a way, but this is, by the way. So apples really have a, a return a, a color, we get color called red, and oranges return color orange we could extend it and say blood oranges and have them returning red as well but like we won't go there um, so let's say we can store the child class object in the parent reference variable apple apple is a new orange here so you've seen this kind of thing going on yeah you must have done it yourself yeah so this is important that we have the parent class and it can point as a reference to the subclass instance here, so this is Apple is the reference, and it's line of code here. Like, I mean, I have seen people in interviews ask the question where they do parent class X equals new Y, okay, and say, what's going on there? <laughs> you can do this. Okay? There are reasons you might want to do this. Okay, so you need to understand this. Look at this. You don't just always go Apple, Apple is new Apple. You know. You can say a new if for any subclass of that. So when we call get color, we get the color of the orange, not the color of apple, even though this is supposed to be an apple. Okay. So what's happening here is that the child class is changing the behavior of the parent class. We expect it to be an apple. Okay. With extras, you know. So this is what the problem is going on here. Okay, so that means that once the child objects are placed, an apple storing an orange object, the behavior has changed, and that's against LSP. So LSP tells us that even if the child object is placed as a parent, the behavior should be not be changed. So if we're getting the color apple instead of orange, it follows LSP. There's some issue with our software design that requires correction. Because apple is our base class, and orange is our child class, and the the main purpose of orange for this particular example is that it changes the behavior. Yeah, we don't want that. We want it to be able to extend the behavior in some way. So in order to make this work, we have to have a completely different design. Oops. Oh, I haven't told you how to do this. I'm going to tell you in one of the lessons for the next one. OK, so any, any suggestions to how we might do this? Any suggestions at all? Yeah, good. Perfect, perfect. That's well done. That's really good. Okay, so, the, and the answer um, is uh, you have a parent class called fruit that you extend, and it implements a virtual method that tells us we need to implement color of the fruit, and then each of these implement that, but they don't change the behavior of that. Okay, you know this, guys. Okay, but you have to also know the reason why you're doing it this particular way and why it's good design and why it's bad design. You know, if somebody says to me, oh, I did a good job in my code, and I'll say to them, great, I love these conversations. Why is it good code, you know? Okay. And if they can say something like this, I'm delighted, you know? Some analysis is required. You're all capable of doing this, so, you know, no bother to you at all. I give the, I'll, I'll work through this example with the fruit extension in the lesson, yep. Yeah. No, I can do this. It's yeah, it's it's fine. Yeah. No, it's 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 probably yeah. I think I can do it that way. I'll check. Okay, I'll do it. I'll I'll code it up. Okay, in the in the order. Okay, thanks. Okay, how are we doing the time? Nearly there, okay. ISP then, um, again, this is, uh, tells us that clients should not be forced to depend on interfaces that they do not use. So it's very similar to SRP, 
And the aim of the principle is to reduce the side effects and frequency of changes by splitting the software into multiple independent parts instead of one big bloated all-encompassing class. So with SRP, the principle strip a class of all variables, methods, or behaviors that do not directly contribute to the role. So methods must contribute to the end goal of their entirety. And the advantage of this is that it splits large methods into smaller, more specific, and ultimately makes the program easier to debug. It also means that you've got lots and lots of methods, which can be a bit of a pain too. So clients should not be forced to depend upon interfaces. So if we wanted to work with 3D shapes, we wanted to calculate volumes in addition to areas, we might have a shape interface um, to ensure that the various methods are implemented. Again, it's similar to the last one. Um, but what's the problem with the design? Any shape that we create must implement the volume method. But we know the squares are flat and they don't have volumes. So that means that we should, um, so instead of having an interface here to implement shapes and volumes, areas and volumes, and squares implement this, cuboid have a volume, but then we're forced to implement a volume for something that doesn't exist. So really we need to have multiple interfaces. And really that's what's happening here. So we have a shape interface, we have a solid shape interface that implements volume and area, and then we have a square that implements a shape interface, and we have a cuboid which interfaces shape and a solid interface. So ISP recommends that instead you could um, call this solid shape interface that has those, and you can implement the interface fairly straightforwardly. Okay, so that's ISP. Our final one is this dependency inversion principle. And that recommends that high level modules should be reusable and unaffected by changes in low-level modules. And that can be achieved by introducing abstractions that decouple. So the best designs for class structures is to begin with the high-level modules, work towards the low-level modules. So high-level classes, abstraction layer, then to low-level classes. So both kinds of classes, modules, for example, should depend on the same extractions, abstractions. Working the other way around is not considered to be a flexible design. What happens if we need to replace a low-level class? You know, so there are all sorts of implications in code if there's no abstractions. So we saw this in CFC30, JSON for Exchange is really good between clients and servers and so forth. You know? So abstractions should not depend on details. Details should depend on abstractions. So this is your takeaway for this slide, okay? Let me show you an example. So here we have a low level class that sends emails, okay? And here we have an SMS class that sends messages. And here we have a notification class that sends notifications to both emails and SMS. And you can see that there's a high dependency of this higher level class on these two low level classes. Okay. So here, the notification class, which is a higher level class, has this dependency on the email and the SMS class. The notification is depending on the concrete implementation of both email and SMS, not their abstractions of the implementation. And that becomes the problem. Okay. And I'll explain this in the short lessons as well with the, the with this one. Really what we need to do is we need to be able to just send a message <laughs> and then have the information embedded in these and so forth. So I'll I'll show how to make that change as well. Okay. But again, Abstractions should not depend on the details, and details should not depend on the abstractions. The abstractions. The design principle doesn't change the direction of the dependencies, as you might expect from reading the name. Okay, it splits the dependency between the high-level and the low-level modules by introducing an abstraction between them. Okay, so that's solid. There's lots in it. There's lots of links. You need to read them. You need to look at the examples. You need to do some work, and you'll have to look at the short lessons to maybe get some further information on each of them. There will be five, one for each of the dependent of the the, um, the solids principles. Thank you very much. See you next week.